So I'm just, we're going to share a little bit. I know Emily's going to pull up the um, presentation. I mentioned something about your voice. Yeah, so <laughs> just <laughs> in case anyone's concerned. Um, I am not sick. I have terrible allergies. I love the valley, but the valley this time of year does not like me. So I, um, before I even came to work, went through all the um, COVID protocols. I do not have a fever. I can still taste things. You know, I went through the whole gamut. So just so people are aware, it is completely allergies. I've been dealing with it since Saturday. So um, it's so much better than what it was even earlier this morning. So bear with me as I uh, go through this. So thank you for that. So um, we're gonna start with Talmud. So I'm gonna really have you focus on, these are infographs that we have put up on the website for really just giving the general outline of what we are doing within the buildings. So again, you're gonna see on each side, we give safety protocols, health and cleaning, the ready for school checklist, just as a reminder for parents um, and students um, coming into school, but really we're gonna focus a little bit on the bottom left for all three of these. Um, I wanna start off by saying, um, as we have built these models, these models have really been, been built in collaboration between the building principals, their building leadership teams and their staff. I have some voice in this, but they are the instructional leaders with the instructional staff and have worked really hard to put these models in place. Again, based on metrics and protocols that continue to shift and trying to build some consistency within all of the programming. So um, as you can see um, from that model, the families that have chosen to go into hybrid will be attending school in person in the morning. Tuesday through Friday. They'll have PE, health, art, and music, uh, and AVID, so our electives at the middle school will remain online in the PM time. So that's when they'll get their electives. And then um, for those students that have chosen to stay in distance learning, they will be uh, continuing on with that online model, but, in their, but most of the time their core classes are in the afternoon. The reason we have to do that is remember our teachers are teaching both in person and virtual. We do not at this time, and we're gonna talk through this during the budget process, have a separate online school. So our online virtual schools are embedded into our buildings. So our teachers are teaching hybrid in person and also teaching virtual because of our staffing and that's the for, for the remainder of this year, we will be coming to you as we go through the budget process to talk about a true K-12 online separate to what the other five schools are doing. So <clears throat> that's really important as I go through these slides because we do not have a separate, we are covering all avenues of that for <clears throat> the schools. Part of that with Talmadge, one of the questions that's asked is there's a little bit more time during the hybrid time. Then when you look at the virtual schedule, there's a little bit less time. Remember when we're in hybrid, they're moving classrooms. We are required to clean. So that when they move from class to class, wipe downing of desks, wipe downing of chairs. So the difference of why hybrid is looking longer is because of those transition times. Because again, we have to fill, not only do academics, social emotional learning, but also we have to do make sure that we're meeting all the safety and health and cleaning. So that's an important piece as we talk about secondary buildings as we move forward with that. Um, they'll often need some time in building. We have new routines. So we know a few weeks of that as we start here is going to be building in those routines. So again, Talmadge is the school that has gone to three feet. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that generally. Um, it does, if we have an outbreak, potentially we have to quarantine more kids. Um, and you know, again, Perry has talked with his staff about that, knowing that potentially they could get kids in 
all of them in at one time. They have enough space to do that. That is not always the case in our other buildings. So again, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, those are some of the big building blocks. We also, just as an example, restrooms. So kids will go to rest. They can only go into the restroom one at a time because we also have cleaning pieces of that that are involved. So passing time, bathrooms are not open. So we are having to build in more time for brain breaks, bathroom breaks, transitions. So I know that that question has been brought up by families. It's not because they're not gonna get the same amount of instruction. It's just, we have more protocols to some degree that we are required to do in person than what they have to do virtually. So again, that's just a quick look at the middle school model. We want to, and then we'll go through all the models and then I'll open the floor up for questions. Emily, next slide, please. <clears throat> so next is the high school. I'm gonna go try and we'll go a little deeper. So again, the same thing. Uh, there has been continued partnership. And again, this is the bottom left um, square. We have continued partnership that this model was built again in collaboration with the administration, in collaboration with the department chairs at the high school. Those department chairs shared it out with the rest of their um, departments to get feedback. High school is a very difficult model. Um, we understand that <clears throat> there are schools that are going full, but again, our teaching staff is doing both hybrid and virtual teaching. So we have to build in time for both of those. <clears throat> so you'll see all students attend online classes in the morning. Then they'll do their uh, in-person classes in the PM. So anybody that has chosen to go into hybrid will come in. And again, we have A weeks, A weeks and B weeks. And again, all of that conversation was in collaboration. Uh, those models came from teaching staff in collaboration with the building principal and moving forward with that. There are lots of different models. If you go across the state, if you go across the country, um, again, to keep that balance of having not having to switch teachers and, and different pieces as best we could, because that still happens. You know, this was really a good model that they felt would be consistent with kids. Um, again, they'll have that alternating weeks, um, and then that virtual only students continue on that online model. A couple of things with the high school that I want to be just cognizant of. You know, when we talk about the difference between six feet, and I'm gonna read what the Ready School Safe Learners, <clears throat> when it talks about physical distancing, the actual language. So under 1C in physical distancing, the new language reads as followed. CDC guidance released on March 19th recommends maintaining six feet of distance between distance cohorts when possible limiting contact with distance cohorts in areas of higher county case rates. Schools then had could, schools that use less than six feet between students in classrooms, distant cohorts is recommended with at least six feet maintaining between distance cohorts. So that's what the first opening paragraph says. Yes, we can move to three feet. However, when you talk about at the secondary level, Couple of things. We have had two outbreaks this week in athletic programs. We've had to shut those athletic programs down as in all of them. So every student that was involved in those programs have been shut down. Should we have been in school right now, all those kids would not be allowed to be in person. The reason we are sticking with six feet is, for example, right now, we're six feet apart. Should I come up positive COVID, none of you get quarantined because we're safe. If we move to three feet, again, high school is a little bit different. We are doing activities. We have to take that into consideration. We are we're literally on a day-to-day -day basis right now having discussions on what are we seeing, 
We know that there is a fair amount of students being tested right now. I know my communication with you this week has been pretty significant and even last end of last week with what we were starting to see. In speaking with Holt, Polk County this morning, they have great concern that there is an uptick. So we're having to monitor that. So again, all of the, these pieces are taken into consideration even as we build these models. One of the things, especially with the high school is we are, you know, graduation credits and graduation itself, we want kids to get to. And, and we are talking about seniors right now, but in general credits for everyone. It is really important, and I've said this from the beginning, in working with our building principals, in collaboration with our union, in collaboration with you, our goal is to get buildings open and keep them open with the beginning models that we are at, with the goal of if we can learn and continue to learn so we can be open all of next year, that's really the end goal. But we are still in some of these waves where we have concerns. With keeping the high school at six feet, regardless, should a student get ill, we do not have to shut the rest of it down. So there is some advantage that we are seeing of staying at six feet. There are not very many weeks left in school. We know that this may not be the favorite model of mine or anyone, but in regards to keeping school open, we feel with, again, in collaboration with our administration, in collaboration with our um, leaders within the building, that we have gone in that, that direction. I'm not gonna speak, again, I have different conversations with our union president, Mr. Gorman. I'm not gonna speak to what he said. I know the conversations I have with him. So again, we, I believe we are aligned. I have great trust that we are moving in that direction based on what we are trying to do in the long run, which is getting schools open, learning for what we need to change, what we need to adapt to be able to get open full-time within the, within the next year. Um, so again, that's a little bit about where we are with the high school model. And then if you go to the next slide with the elementaries, again, we are, it's that lower um, left corner. We are staying um, currently with that AM and PM. One of the things that we have is our class size is really no bigger than 12. I can tell you because I have been walking through buildings to see, especially K-5, I walk twice a week in buildings because I want to see how the instruction is going where we are. With the small cohorts, two hours a day, our teachers are getting to move the needle faster than if they have 20 kids or 30 kids in a classroom. Now, I know that that's not a favorite of, of everyone, but again, the model of being able to get students in in small cohorts with direct instruction, we are seeing gains. And I'll share a little bit more of what I've seen when I talk about assessment uh, in the next section. So again, at this moment, we are staying in the AM and PM. We're having the consistency with the routines. We're seeing successes there. We still have PE and music through their live instructions. And then they have additional time that they can do some after school enrichment things um, online. Again, a couple other pieces I want to just reiterate just from a general talking point about all three levels. It's really important, our staff, we are in the requirements of Ready School Safe Learners. They are technically required to stay six feet. That doesn't mean that they don't go in and out, but we're being very cognizant of how much you go in and out because if there is an exposure there's a potential that if I have been close to Darcy for more than 15 minutes of less than six feet, then I'm out as a teacher. We have hired additional subs. Every building has at least two subs, if not more. We are continuing to try and hire in more teaching staff. We've continued to partner with uh, Western Oregon to work with our student teachers who have been amazing. We are going to have a great working staff. I'm very thankful for Wu and their flexibility and allowing student teachers to come and teach with us more because they're allowing us to have 
keep that space and those distancing so our teachers can keep doing what they're doing. Um, again, as I said, one of the things, and we're gonna watch it with um, Talmadge because they are at three feet. If we do have any type of um, positive case, if I'm in the middle, anybody that's three feet around me will have to be quarantined. Um, so again, we're sort of taking that risk and that's okay because we felt it was the right choice for Talmadge. They have a little bit more space to be able to do that um, from a middle school perspective. So again, we'll continue to watch that because the definition of close contact is under six feet for more than 15 minutes. So if you are under six feet for more than 15 minutes and somebody tests positive for COVID, then you are quarantined at a minimum seven days you can go get a test. And if your test is negative on the eighth day, you can come back. But some people are not being tested. We've had students, we have had students test positive. You know, we've had parents reach out to us to say their student has tested positive and they're just gonna keep them out for 14 days. So we are having both cases in the classroom and families communicating with us that, hey, Jen Kibis is not gonna be in school. She has tested positive for COVID. We're keeping her out for 14 days. So we are getting those phone calls as well um, from our, from our um, families. Um, again, I wanna be clear, and I've been wanna say this since the beginning. This is in collaboration with our leadership in our buildings. We have amazing principals. They're in collaboration with their building staff, their leadership groups, and then communicating that with their staff. These decisions have not been made by me. I am part of that conversation as they have those pieces, because again, you know, they don't all need to look the same. We're trying to build a sustainable model to have some in-person learning through the rest of this year, learning as much as we can, because we feel and we're seeing that potentially by the fall, we could be far enough along that potentially we could have students in knowing that masks will probably still be part of the equation, et cetera. So again, some of those pieces are still part of that um, conversation. So I'm gonna um, just pause again, these models, we think we'll have less issues of quarantine kids should we have um, an, uh, someone test positive. Again, our goal has to been to build, to move open safely first and foremost. And then once we kept it open, We'll keep moving, moving forward. So I want to, I want to do two more slides, and then um, just sort of to say next steps. So people keep asking, oh, 80 percent of the kids want to be our students want to be in hybrid. That's what our families are telling us. So here's a breakdown of our buildings. So the middle left column is the schools. Middle column is the total number of students in hybrid. And then the right column is the total percentage of students. So Ash Creek has 65% of their students in hybrid, Independence 83, Monmouth 73, Talmadge 59, and Central 62, excuse me, 72. So our total district-wide percentage of students in hybrid is 69%. So 30% of our 31% of our students are still online. Again, which we are supporting with our teaching staff. Let me go one more and then I'll open up for questions. Yep, absolutely. So then the last one I'm going to show you is, and I know you probably can't see the far right. So this is our look back for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to continue to look at our data. So our last two week look back, we were 77.2% with a 2.4% test positivity. As of today, we are back up to 139.9 and at 5.4% positivity. To talk a little bit further, um, Wu also does some metrics um, and they had a document today. So last week, there are 36 counties in Oregon. You wanna be 36, that means you have very little cases. Last week, we were 27th of 36. This week, we're 11 of 36 we are going in the wrong direction and we have to pay attention to that. We are not gonna close schools. We are keeping and moving forward with what we're going to do, but we are paying close attention to this. We're also paying close attention and I can't share demographics, but I have some gen general demographics of the zero to 19. There are more students 
in the ages zero to 19 that are testing positive for COVID. So again, before I talk about next steps, I'll open up for questions before we do sort of what's on the horizon and then talk a little bit about state assessment. Do you want to ask your question, Darcy? Go ahead and back a slide. So I, I, sometimes I get a little confused between like Lippy and hybrids because they are two different things, but sometimes I hear us saying hybrid and then sometimes it's interchangeable with Lippy. So Lippy has to some degree is no longer yeah. with the new guidance. So is it the guidance <clears throat> that made us that shift? Because I don't physically, I guess, understand. There's no, there's no, there's not a significant change to the elementary. So the elementary, we did sort of an expanded lippy to say, how can we get kids in a couple hours a day? Yeah, but are we actually hybrid in the high school? We will be as of April 20th. We're not right now. Nope, we are still in comprehensive distance learning. We will be as of to the 20th. That gets confusing for yeah. people because I, we aren't right now, but we're saying we are. So both the middle school and the high school, as of April 20th, will be in hybrid learning. Again, that communication is coming from the principals. Again, community has shared with us that they want that information coming from their buildings. So I know both Principal Servigna and Principal Abounty have been continuing to communicate, answer questions uh, from their communities um, of when that starts. But yes, we technically start on April 20th. Good question. Yes, Jan. I want to thank you for clarifying some misapprehensions that are in the community. Um, my job has been explaining any number of times there was collaboration in building this, and that you were not in some little room by yourself doing it. I mean, I. I knew that anyway, but I'm happy to hear you say it, that teachers and principals, and I assume to some degree parents, were involved in developing this model. I also want to state that no model is perfect. Correct. But I really appreciate the information that you shared. And I'm particularly appreciative of learning that we are now number 11. That's horrifying that Polk County has that many cases. So, and 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 again with the new guidance, you know, if we get over that two hundred, again, I'm going to be in continued conversation with our principals. Again, I hope that this is a blip, and that next week it will go down. Um, we. <laughs> We are back to the numbers per day as what we were almost in November, December, which is starting to be concerning to us. Again, our goal is to stay open and get kids in to try and get them back into what school is, what that looks like, what that feels like, um, knowing that, again, we're trying to learn and adjust and keep things safe for kids, for staff in a very, very hard year. It was also good as a reminder that our teachers are doing two different kinds of teaching. Um, I have some relatives that are teachers in Salem Kaiser, and um, I wondered why they were in school more than us. Well, it turns out they have a complete online academy called, I forgot what it's called, Edge. Yeah, I believe so. Or if you're talking Salem Kaiser, yeah. correct. So there's two completely different educational models going on in a district in Salem Kaiser and other districts like them. So that's how come they can have more time for kids in school because they have separate. Yeah, completely separate. At times our, our, our teachers are doing, they're doing similar lessons, but at times they might be doing two different lessons, one online and one for in-person. Again, they're trying to keep consistency of the standards um, but again, that's a big, big part of that conversation. We will be, in, again, as we tar start talking about budget, we are going to be coming to you with a proposal mm -hmm. 
again, in working with the community, because we're about to get some information out to the community of, we have families that have said to me, to our principals, even to some of you, are you going to have that online component? Because until everyone is vaccinated or to to that point, my student will not walk back in your building. I've also have families that kids are excelling at the online. So they want to keep them excelling in that direction. So we will be coming to you with a proposal um, that again, when we are talking about short term, because it could be a short term, but then how do we build it into a long term within our budgeting capacity? So it's that sort of, we have this one time money to start. What does that mean? Allows us to start to learn and build. And then can we sustain it, which is what we're wanting, wanting to be able to see how many total kids in a district our size does a K-12 online component? Is it 100 kids? Is it 200 kids? You know, that's going to be right now it's 1,000. So if, I mean, if Emily, if you, can you go back one slide for me? If you go back one slide, our enrollment right now is 31, um, 3153, we're at 2176 in building. So right now, a thousand of our students are staying online right now. We're not saying that that's what it's gonna be next year, but we'll start those conversations with the community with a survey to start gathering that information. Will our principals, teachers, and support staff need halos? They really do. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, you're I, totally <laughs> fine. I took a breather. Um, so I noticed when you were giving us numbers and then you mentioned about football that this things had been shut down because people ended up with COVID. But then I remember a student this Macbeth. Saying Jill. that they were having Girl, coming. homecoming on Friday and letting the court walk around, but you said we so we we are. I I didn't say football. It will is going to down. I didn't say what sport, but, but that is one of the sports that we are having to shut down. We are in the midst of obviously communicating with families first. I know that Principal Servinia will continue to work because obviously we're going to have to make a shift because we're not going to be able to play on Friday. So again, these are the constant moving parts that we'll have to continue to work through. Again, we had a meeting, it's, and this is what I will tell you. Again, yesterday was a holiday for some. My building principal at the high school, my athletic director, my director of security were in a text message with me yesterday working through this. So when I say our, we are working, we are working. We're even working on times where I'm actually trying to say, please don't work on some, on this day because I want to honor people. And again, as we talk about equity, that means race, religion, national origin, et cetera. So again, three o'clock yesterday till about, I don't know, 4.30, we were in a constant text message and then had a meeting this morning right at 7 a.m. to work through one of the... Um, athletic issues that we were working through. I was made aware by my own children, by their friends. So I just yeah. assumed that the community was finding out that way. Yeah, and we are they are. We were getting that. That's some of the next steps we're doing. So, so thank does you. that mean that homecoming is part of it for the students has been canceled? I have not had a chance to, again, my, my focus this morning with yeah. our principal server now was football. I will follow up with her. I'm sure they'll communicate out if they're going to make them, what that change will look like. I, I have a question as well, Jen. Um, so Lippy's going away and then hybrid's taking over. You, you, you explained that fine. Uh, I know that Lippy was uh, mainly at-risk kids and seniors. Um, yep. So are they yes. any, any way... Are they losing out any hours at all or, or gaining any hours or is it being adjusted in any way? So they're, they're the, at the elementary, our students that were limited in person are still coming in on Mondays for two hours. So we do still have that going. With the change in the high school, that will get embedded into the day. Um, so again, they'll be in there for about two and a half hours doing, you know, with their teachers working through what they need to. So it's not loss, it's not gain, it's about the same. Okay. 
Ken, are these kids, uh, seniors especially, are they getting enough actual instruction to graduate? That's what, yeah. I mean, again, part of this is, and again, when you talk about, um, you know, one of the things where I think we need to do a better job when we get back to whatever normal looks like, because I don't even know when we get back in person, we've learned so much. Things are not going to look the same regardless. Um, but part of that is, you know, what, what when we talk about standards, so students have to meet the standards of 12th grade and they do all the standards through high school. Right now, what the team is working on at, at Donna's level is working to say, how do we make sure that we know that kids know the content that yes, we can give them credit for that. So again, that's really why they're doing that instruction in the morning. And then the afternoon is really some, you know, with small groups of students to be able to have that connection. What are you struggling with? We wanna make sure you know those standards so that we can earn, get them to earn credit. And then for those seniors that they have their graduation requirements. We do know that, and again, I'll talk about summer school here in a, a minute, just as a of where some of our next steps are. We know that there may be some students that will need to do some work over the summer to potentially regain a credit. The administration at the high school is working on that plan in a couple different ways. And I'll talk a little bit about that next in the next step. So we believe that's partly why we're doing this model, still giving them that core instruction in the morning because that's really important. And then being able to do their labs and other things in the afternoon um, so that we can make sure that they're moving in the right direction. Well, one, one other thing that on that other slide, the- uh, Metrics. The 139.9. We go forward one for me, please, Emily. Now that's 139.9 per 100,000. Is that what we're talking about? Correct. So that's 0.13%. If you do the math, that's pretty quite a bit down from the 250 that we talked about the last board meeting. Agree, agree. So I want that number to be not in the hundreds. If that number is, and I fully believe this, if that number stays below 100, I don't think we're going to have issues with, we may still have issues of, a small, you know, someone getting it. But right now what's happening and we're seeing it in athletics, it's spreading and we're trying to stop it. And again, some of that is because of the close contact, right? Again, we just have to monitor it. We know that we've been informed that multiple kids are going to get tests right now because they have had contact with some of the students that have tested positive. So again, we have some meetings tomorrow. We'll, we're meeting every day to make sure. Um, we did have another um, positive case that we were concerned was gonna affect two other activity groups, but that student was not there last Thursday when those groups had activities. So those groups are safe. So again, we still have a lot of moving things, especially with the close contact. Again, six feet apart, I test positive, you all are safe. Unless, you know, I'm always in I'm Steve's a, area, but again, that's what our teachers are monitoring and why we set up the buildings the way we have. I think a um, couple of questions that I have. So we heard tonight and we're, we've been getting emails about all these other districts that have gone to full in-person. Um, what is it about those districts that's allowing them to do that? And are they doing, I mean, you were, as you were talking about the schedules in the middle school, the high school, and having to do the cleaning protocols and additional time, I would imagine even these schools that are saying that they're going back to full in person, it, and I wish I knew this, but I don't know exactly how they're doing that. I think a couple things. Some of the, some of the school districts are smaller in size. So again, I'll give you an example because he's in our because he's in our Polk County Collaborative, Perrydale. So Perrydale, smaller school district, has space to be able to do that. Again, we have spaces to be able to do that, but our, we don't have enough teaching staff to cover both hybrid and virtual. Perrydale, as an example, a majority of their kids are in person. 
we have 30% that are not. So again, his conversation is like, yeah, most of our kids truly are in, there's handfuls. So again, smaller school districts, a little bit more room, a little bit more flexibility. Albany, I know was given as an example. I've heard that their K-5 is going back. Their case rates are low. I think they've been in lower numbers for quite some time. Um, so again, I think that consistency of their case numbers and again, not having spread. I'll give you an example. We are still having outbreaks with our staff. Again, we have our Polk County Collaborative with our um, superintendents in our area. We've had over now, I think it's 27 staff overall through the year that have tested positive. They've had like four. We still are having staff test positive. Again, I think that's it's just part of what we are trying to maneuver th through. And please, as I say that, that does not mean our staff are being reckless. We're, tr we're very clear in trying to continue. And then when we do get concerns about what's going on, which we had a couple today, we are following up. We are reiterating with our staff that the safety protocols are very important in this process. So again, I think, you know, not having you the know, variety of correct. factors. The yeah. online academies in certain districts is a big piece of it. Correct. So that's a it solves for the distance learning. Correct. Which we are not able to. Which again, we are going to be bringing you guys a, a proposal to potentially move in that direction. Last month at the board meeting, I mentioned the uh, Department of Health had put out the scorecard, and I'm looking at it right now. There's 220,000 uh, students in the state. 50,000 of those as of the week of March uh, 20th were in person on site. So 50,000 out of 220,000. So I'm sure that number is going up. Sure. Yep. But I think just to keep in mind, we're probably not, I think we're probably in the middle of the pack in terms of what we're trying to do and trying to be hybrid. There's a lot of, lot of schools that are still completely comprehensive distance learning. Um, so, but yeah, so that, that's just, I think, good to keep in mind. And we will, again, we're, we are learning a ton. Like I've shared with you all, like we continue to talk through, you know, we are trying to, once we have everybody in, in some sort of hybrid in person as of the 20th, our goal is to keep everybody in and not have to close down. I know that Emily and I have been in lots of reaching out to different school districts. We are also aware that school districts are also dealing with very similar things as we are that SPART started in athletics and they're in school. So it's now potentially causing issues where they may have to bring their whole school down. I, I was gonna ask you that, was, were there, do we know of any situations where schools have gone back fully, but because they aren't doing like the six foot, maybe they've done a three foot, they're at risk of having to shut down. We, like, we are aware, and again, both Emily and, and Jason Clark in conversations that, because again, we are talking to lots of people. We're trying to learn and grow and do, again, our principals are doing the same thing. But again, that is, we are aware, or I became aware of from Jason and Emily today that there is a school district that is dealing with a very similar type of situation that is playing out in their activities is how I'll phrase it. They're, they're not being able to contact race because it's they can't figure out where it started and people are continuing to get tested. Now, again, I believe once we're in, with at least K-5 in the high school, we'll watch the middle school. If we have to adjust, we will. I think we'll be fine because they do have a lot of space in the middle school. I hope we, we the goal is that we, that doesn't happen. But yes, we are aware of a handful of school districts that are now starting to deal with that. Yeah, the middle schools, the the least percentage of of in person students Correct. I saw at fifty nine. Yeah, they're fifty nine. So I, I had a question: if we can rewind back a little, I don't need to rewind that the screen, but in in conversation when you had mentioned about being uh, a teacher being within six feet of their student for more than fifteen minutes, or that's that's what we're close contact. About. Yep. Yeah. So, well, two questions. One. 
uh, I know that a lot of our our coaches are also teachers. So in those those groups that are that are being shut down and and students that are in quarantine, uh, obviously students aren't vaccinated. Teachers could be vaccinated. So if they're vaccinated. Do they have to go into quarantine? No. So if you are vaccinated, so again, I'm vaccinated. Should, again, I'm going to use Steve as an example. Should Steve get COVID or, you know, I'm exposed to him. He has COVID. I do not have to quarantine. I do need to watch for signs and sure. symptoms because I can still potentially get it, right? No vac. you know, again, we talk about the vaccine is one tool in our toolbox, um, but I can also still, if he were to give it to me, I may not get it. I could be asymptomatic. I could potentially give it to her. But again, the vaccine, part of that reason of the vaccine and the high percentage, because especially both of them are at about an 80%, just to give you an idea from the vaccine standpoint, a flu shot is 47% efficacy. We're in the 80s for the vaccine. So again, with with these outbreaks, if you are vaccinated, you do not have to quarantine. You can report to work. However, we're still asking them to watch for signs and symptoms um, so and be we, aware. We of that. We're not worried about losing losing staff that are vaccinated. Correct. That. Correct. That's partly why the governor very much pushed for educators to be vaccinated because we figured that this would come that once the from the CDC at some point because it's such the efficacy is so high that again, we wouldn't have to then quarantine our teaching staff. We are finally to that point where again, we've everyone's vaccinated and inoculated to some degree. Some people may still be working through those processes, but staff is back in the buildings. So that should not be an issue anymore. Okay, thank you. Yeah. General or the kids that have been yeah, most of them so far have been symptomatic. Okay, there, let's. Um, oh, sorry. Is there anything else that we could be doing between now and the end of the school year to get more kids back in the building? So um, I think one of the key pieces that were, um, you know, transportation, and again, I'm going to say the three feet of transportation is a recommendation. It is not a required. You know, we're having constant conversation about, and again, when they talk about a bus, buses confined, they're closer, we can have windows down. You know, some of that discussion Again, I wouldn't say with the way we're going up right now, I would be in favor of that. I'm continuing to have that conversation with Polk County. Again, I wanna be clear about Polk County. They're there for a resource for me to ask questions because we know that myself, you all um, in collaboration with the principals and our union leadership are really the ones making the final decision. Um, but the comment that I have has been shared with me is they wouldn't put it as a recommendation if they didn't think it was probably the best thing to do at this moment. So again, we are running into a little bit of transportation concerns for students that we are required to bus. Um, so again, we're getting to a point to some degree of saying everybody where they're at is where they're at. Um, again, if we have, you know, part of this is another big shift. It doesn't, I can't just turn and say, okay, we're gonna to move to three feet and that's gonna take us at least a week, two weeks. We have exactly about 10 weeks left of school. And for me, the teaching and learning, both in the amazing work our staff have done in CDL, which I would say, I put it up against the majority of the CDLs. I think we've done a phenomenal job because I see from walking the buildings, what the kids are doing academically. Not saying that all kids are on track. I want to be clear about that. But we are, there is movement of students in the learning. We will have, we will have to do summer school, as I've shared. We will need to catch kids up. We want to make sure socially, emotionally, kids are in place. But that concerns me as if we make another shift, that is at least a week and a half to two to make the shift, communicate out, 
give staff time to make that shift, redo to some degree cohorts because we did cohort them. So again, we can do that, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to take us two weeks. And then we're going to have to reteach kids, new protocols. They already have had it, but it's different spacing. To watch a kindergartner be in a classroom, walk outside, because outside their doors where they can have a mass break, do, do the protocol, take their mask down, take a couple deep breaths, put their mask back on and re-engage into school is pretty amazing for a five-year-old to do. Again, we're not saying that all of them have that concept, but again, you're seeing those pieces of what we're trying to be able to do. So, you know, we had the conversation this morning with the principals who are continuing to, another shift is just another shift and it's gonna take time. And we have 10 weeks of school left. So it's, if you could solve the transportation thing and solve the cohort, staffing schedule changes you could potentially do something but, but by that week of, we're going to have the eight amount of weeks left the amount of disruption and time wouldn't necessarily benefit us that much and that is our opinions of the building principals in conversation with their teachers and then obviously you know my staff and my voice in that but again we're we're constantly having those conversations I meet with building principals on Wednesdays, one-on-one. -on -one. We'll continue to have those conversations. Um, again, we know that this, all of us, you know, it's not our favorite model, but I also know that I'm not confident, and I'll say that as the superintendent, of going everybody in, that we won't have shutdowns of large groups, and that cannot happen at the high school. We've got to keep them both either in person or online moving towards graduation, as well as our students really K-12, K because that needs to be the priority. We also don't know. I mean, I hate to relate to this because it's a terrible analogy, but with farming, you can screw up every single day, but what you learn from screwing up that day is what not to do the next day. So in terms of like, um, we got to get them in the school to. We got to get them in to see if we're screwing up and got to fix. Correct. It. We have got to get them in. And that's what we're doing because we're trying to figure out. Because again, there's some kids have struggled with it, some kids have not. There's a honeymoon period. Yeah, and I get that. I, in the last couple of weeks, have walked through every single one of our buildings except two, and I have been welcomed. It's also been absolutely life changing to see those students and the teachers and the systems that are, I mean, it's just amazing to see what we have done. But we have to keep going and get them in. So the goal would be stable, stay with what we can, these hybrid models through the rest of the school year, learn as much as we can with an eye towards catching up in summer school. And then I towards fall. Right, as, with the as, goal as normal as we can. As normal as we can. Because we're learning a ton and we're the systems are so different <laughs> than what they were. So that's going to be our goal in the fall is to open the schools all the way up so that that's that would be my kid, goal. Again, every kid I that think wants to go to school in person or every family that wants correct, to go to school correct. can have their kid in school correct time. That's that would be our goal. And again, Emily, can you jump slide one slide forward for me? So just, just some pieces to sort of what's next. Again, continuing with our Polk County Collaborative, we're meeting every other week with the soups and our, the health department, because that's been really beneficial for all of us in our learning. We're gonna continue to monitor the cases and test positivity. We are in the midst of developing summer programming. C shared a little bit about, we have built budgets in our federal funding but the legislator is in the process right now of potentially adding more money for summer school. What we're looking at is sort of a traditional summer school. We usually run right after school, about a five week summer school to do something similar with that K-5. Then looking at jumpstart programs um, through in August. So K-1 as an example. And again, I wanna be clear, we are still building this in collaboration with teachers 
in collaboration with our building principals, potentially a jumpstart program. So K1s, six sevens, nine tens who have not been in the schools, didn't have any transition like our ninth graders this year, that'll be 10th graders, just getting them a little bit more time before the school year starts. Credit recovery at the high school, being focused on a couple weeks for ELA, a couple weeks after that math, also doing what's called recovery services for students uh, receiving disabilities or potentially some intervention time. So again, all of those is what we're looking at from a summer development program. Uh, so we're still in, in, in communication with that. The next bullet is I'm hoping to bring to you all in May, what I'm gonna say is a draft calendar for 21-22. Saying that, we also know that there's probably going to be an update in Ready School Safe Learners either June or July. So again, you know, we're going to build based off of what we've learned. We know that kids, students are being vaccinated, right? You're now seeing more and more of that happening. You're continuing to see the federal government push that. So there could be a push through the summer to get students vaccinated. That tool will be a game changer if that does happen, because that will allow us to potentially get students in faster. Um, but there's, again, a lot of moving parts with that. So yeah, our end goal, if everything aligns, will be to get kids back in school, as many of them as we can, as whoever wants to be, also knowing that we're potentially going to have another online school that will be separate than the five that we currently have. And again, we'll talk through that during the budget process. We're starting kinder registration. So we'll do that on April 27th from 3.30 to six at each of the schools. We're gonna have some sites set up. Can also do it online. Obviously we're starting the budget committee and then we're gonna to start to pull the community committee back together April 28th and May 19th. So we'll get those on everybody's calendars moving forward. So these are really our big, big next steps. Jen, do you have, uh any concerns about having enough staff for a summer school program? So a couple pieces we're talking about. We always do partnership with WU because it's a great training ground for our teaching staff. So we partner with mentor teachers and WU teachers. So we hope to continue that model where it may not be as stressful on teachers because you're sort of co-teaching and then sort of backing out and letting the student teachers do the teaching. So we, we built that model. I think this will be potentially be our third year of doing that. Um, we actually have a uh, one of our bilingual scholars who does not work in our school district, but she's going to come back and help us continue to develop that and run that for us. Um, so we're excited to, to do that, and hopefully I can steal her back. Um, I guess the, the flip side of that question is, you know, my guess is that the numbers of kids in summer school should be twice what they usually are, maybe three times what they usually are based on how far kids might have slipped back. But we don't really have any way to ensure that or to encourage that. I mean, it, or assess it. We, we're, yeah, we're working yeah. on the assessment part. So we are, we believe we'll have some tools that will be able to assess where they are and help guide some of that direction. Um, but I will also say that's part of the reason we're talking about jumpstart. We are continuing to have, so we, we have meet and confer with the union. So we meet twice a month just to talk through things. I'm going to talk specifically with our licensed union right now. With our licensed union, we started talking about summer school. They have recommended to move summer school towards August. That will give teachers a break through June and July. And I want to be clear, our teachers need a break. If you've never taught, they give their blood, sweat, tears, and souls every day. People always give teachers and our classified staff a bad name because we don't work in the summers. You come do what we do 10 hours, some 10 hours a day at times for our teaching staff. We don't want them to. We're trying to keep them within their hours because of what's happened this year. But psychologically, the, the, what they put in during the year they need time to recoup, renew, and recover to be prepared to give that much to our students each and every year. Well, every, everybody needs a break, and it would be nice 
not only to take that break, but also to give another month for vaccines, for treatments, for guidelines to, to move another month forward. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate that because we'll, we'll continue to watch that. Teachers also have to go back to school in the summer. It's true. Because their credentials, <laughs> to renew your teaching credential, you yeah. have to prove Correct. that you've had X number of hours of education. It is um, lots and lots of them it are in like school. Seems like the state could give them some OG, OJT time. Yeah. We do get that. We could do that. <laughs> we so, do that. Um, I'm going to jump forward two slides just because I want to quickly talk about state assessment. So um, we learned late last week that the um, federal government or the Oregon Department of Education confirmed that state assessments are required federally. Um, so that means our summative state assessments that we do every year are technically required. However, with that, I'm going to use the word accountability has been waived. And what accountability means for us as a school district is when we do state testing, we have to have at least 95% of our students or more take the test to meet the accountability measure. That's how we get our federal funding. Funding. So when CES talks about Title I, Title II, those are federal dollars that normally for state assessment, we have to meet that accountability. That's why you hear principals at times, like they're calling families, hey, you know, can we can come pick up Jen Cabista? We need to have her test. That's part of the process of accountability. That's being waived. So our federal funding is not in jeopardy for 2021 if we don't do state assessment. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. Our federal funding, because accountability is waived, does not put our federal funding in jeopardy for 21-22. So we have, again, in continued collaboration with the principals, with our, and I'm gonna, again, specifically with the licensed union, we have had conversation amongst ourselves that we are not in favor of doing state summative assessment. It is shortened this year because again, uh, Oregon Department of Ed has shared what it looks like, but to be very honest, as a leadership team from a teaching and learning side, we are not in favor of this. You'll see in that bowl below, there are many states that are choosing not to do it. Again, because the accountability waiver plays into this. Our goal just in our conversations is that we continue with the teaching and learning of students and not taking, because it usually takes us a month to do state assessment. It probably wouldn't take us that long, but it probably will still take us two weeks. So we are recommending to families, we're right now on the, on the website, we have opt out forms. We actually are going to be posting and we'll be communicating out to families. And again, I want to be clear as a superintendent, this is the only time you'll probably ever hear me say this because of this year. Outside of this year, state assessment is very important to us. It tells us where our kids are at to allow us to build what do we need to adjust to, again, continue that forward. So I want to be clear as a superintendent, this will not be what I say next year. We will want people to take state summative assessments. It's really important in our data. But for this year, because of the learning loss, we would like people to opt in. So well, there will be new paperwork that will be posted. We will get a communication out to families. We are probably going to look at a Saturday late May to do this testing. Might do it all at the high school. We're, not, we're still working through some of those pieces. Um, but we will be getting out to families. If you really want your student to take the state assessment, you're gonna, we wanna have them opt in instead of opt out of that process. So that's a little bit of a change. Um, again, uh, this, yeah, if, you, if you're on the website, currently, if you go on the website, the opt outs are the right at the top of the website, but we'll end up sharing it out to families, mm -hmm. attach it in emails that have it, or here's where it is on the website so they can, go get those opt-in forms. So we're sort of flipping it to say, 
you know, please, please share with us and, and get those to us if you would like to do state testing. Now, didn't the federal government just reverse itself on that and say you have to have the testing? Yeah, they did, but we don't have to do the accountability waiver. So our offending is not in jeopardy. So there's no incentive. To there's no that. incentive. Well, there's no incentive to take the thing. Why? Why? Because, because families may still want to. Because half the kids are going to plunk it this year. Well, again, the I ones, think the ones that are behind the eight ball. Most of my grandchildren are behind the eight ball. Uh, yeah, it's not the I right think time. Pretty smart kids because they're related to me, but <laughs> but uh, the online thing. Some of them are doing all right, but, but none of them are really thriving on it. And so, if this test doesn't mean anything for accountability, why even bother? That's basically what she's saying. I know you're because gonna, you're going to have to opt in if you want to take the test. Because I know if the, the Pharaoh says, let it, so let it be written, so let it be done. But in this case, it's really not going to, the, the scores, the statistics aren't going to mean anything. Right. So why bother? Correct. But again, this will be the only time I say this because we will need it next year. Because again, we'll, you know, if we are in fully for a year. So will those stats track, be, be tabulated in some way by somebody to say, well, Central School District, even though their accountability is waived, they had this many kids test. Correct. Yes. Yep. Wow. So, so you know, part of our, part of our, correct. So yeah, that's what I mean. Correct. Money. Yes. I don't, I don't like that at all. Yeah. So, yes, it will be counted towards that for students that want to take it. So we'll get that piece of it. But it um, doesn't affect their funding. Correct. Correct. I um, I guess I, you said that next year you're going to say we have to take it. And I know that's your job. I just want to say as a long-term educator, I don't like the state test. Agree. <laughs> I don't think they measure what the kids learn. It takes weeks of teaching time to prepare the kids for the test. Um, what she said. I, <laughs> I absolutely think that the current tests that we have are good for data, but they certainly aren't good for instruction. And <clears throat> I, I'm happy to hear you say that we have the opt-in thing because um, as much as I respect you, I would have argued loudly <laughs> if you would have said we were going to go ahead and, and mandate to take the tests. Those tests are a burden on a teacher and on a student as they exist right now. So um, I am going to be a champion of the Take the test if you want, but don't make the rest of us do it. Yep. And I, I do think, Jan, and I appreciate that because, again. Well, you know, I'll argue with you. I know you will. <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> again, it's an important it's an important part of the process. However, there are other assessments that we are going to that our teachers do on a daily basis that are much more important. The DRA plus, correct. Is a much better assessment of a child's reading ability than the state assessment. Right. And then we can, we're starting to look at because we are aligning our essential standards and having, you know, key standards that then again, we, with the state assessment, there are some bigger standards, you know, that are always going to be in that. So again, trying to align and making sure what we're teaching can transfer to real world, let's be honest, because that's what we want kids to be good learners and to be good citizens. The state says at times tells us some of that information. I'll probably get, I don't know, <laughs> death threats or something for speaking against this current state assessments, but I've seen the effect on teaching, which means the effect on children. Yep. Doesn't work. So I think you have the board's support <laughs> to proceed with the opt-in. Certainly the vocal one. <laughs> I hear that colleges are starting to consider not looking at some of those tests too. Yep. They'll take your money. Yeah, they'll mm -hmm. make any money right now. So before you, we go to our final pieces. We did 